Good morning. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, sure, yeah. It can happen. Um, yeah, 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 that's like that, right? He means like that. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a crazy week. I know there's a lot of things going on, so I appreciate you guys coming. Uh, this is the third seminar, the third seminar we have <laughs> this week. So anyway, but things, you know, work out that way sometimes. Um, our speaker today is uh, Jorge Brenner. Uh, he's the Associate Director of Marine Science at the uh, Texas chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we scheduled this seminar three times, I think, and we changed the date, and two weeks later, we learned that uh, Lisa Lane was coming this same week, and I said, you know what, to the heck with it. We're gonna move forward with this and then have three <laughs> seminars the same week, so. Uh, Jorge has a PhD in marine science from the uh, Polytechnic University of Catalonia in Spain. That's the same school I got my PhD from. And as a matter of fact, we're talking about it, and we had the same professors for some subjects. So um, um, Jorge has to uh, wear a lot of hats, as it is the case for many people at TNC. Uh, his work uh, includes many issues in coastal uh, environments, ranging from sea level rise to uh, wetland ecology to bear migration. And, uh, it also ranges from basic to applied science, but mostly applied because one of the most important missions of TNC is to help managers, you know, basically translate research into uh, management needs. Um, something else that I think is important for you guys, for your students, is uh, having uh, Jorge here to tell you about TNC as a potential outlet, you know, when you're looking for jobs up there. TNC uh, has good jobs for you guys to consider. So that's something else he'll be talking about. Uh, what else? And with that, I think, uh, Jorge, thank you for coming. <laughs> And you got, a, you got a good number of people. Yeah. Really, you did, so good. All right, man. Well, thank you so much just uh, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, over the years in my, in my job, I, I provide a lot of presentations to decision makers and more policy coordination meetings, and not that many to actually scientists. Um, but we do a lot of science with the Nature Conservancy, and I'm going to show you examples of that. So today, during my presentation, I'll be talking about, um, bless you, I'll be talking about the Nature Conservancy, what is that we do, who we are. Uh, I'm going to be showing you examples of the projects that I conduct in my, uh, with my staff in my program, uh, which is the Marine Science Program of the Texas Chapter, and I want to explain what more these chapters and programs are. Then uh, I'm going to just touch a little bit uh, on, on some uh, aspects of biodiversity of the Gulf of Mexico. I'm uh, definitely not, not a, a, an expert on every, every aspect of biodiversity, but that's a, a, a very in, um, um, close part of science that, uh, that we, we do in working with species and habitats. And then I'm going to show you uh, what we are doing on migratory species and why we're choosing that uh, and what type of results are we finding in, in identifying pathways of migratory vertebrates along the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so to begin with, uh, the mission of the Nature Conservancy now, because we change missions every a few years, and TNC has been along since, uh, around since 1951. Now, these days, it's to conserve the lands and waters on which all life on Earth depends on. Years ago, TNC was very focused on species. Uh, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, we, we switched from only species to also habitats on which those species depend on. And more recently, we are integrating humans as part of, obviously, biosphere and, uh, and, and, and also a very important part of our work because we get uh, resources to, to, uh, to achieve our mission and conduct our work by, um, uh, by help, I mean, having people understand the value of uh, the, the conservation work that we do. So we will also, in return, like to develop uh, science and, and conservation work for also for human life support systems. So the Texas chapter that I work for, it's one of the 50 chapters in, in the United States. Every state has a, a program. Some of them are smaller, some of them are bigger for different reasons. Some states are bigger, but also some states have more people involved in conservation. So that, that's just the nature of how things work. Uh, the Texas chapter got started in 1964, so a lot of, uh, a lot of years and working in, in, in Texas. We, I was telling you this morning that um, in our uh, breakfast conversation that we we hold uh, and, and own more than 40 properties in Texas. Uh, this, this is a network of protected areas that we, we, uh, we protect, we manage actively most of them. Uh, some of these properties range from 
a uh, few acres to, uh, they uh, might average um, around 4,000 acres, but we actually own properties as big as 80,000 acres in Texas. I mean, big state, big pieces of land, and um, uh, these, uh, some of them are open to the public, some of them are used for research, most of them are actually used for research. Um, Nature Conservancy is the largest NGO, con non-governmental organization in the world. I mean, there's organizations that have been around a, 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 a lot of times, but they, they, their strategies are different. They come to, to develop some programs and then they go out. Nature Conservancy actually has developed programs that stay in, in these different continents. We work in all six continents and um, in programs, the, the largest programs being North America, Mexico and Central America, South America, Asia Pacific. We have a lot of work on marine um, uh, uh, bi biology, uh, coral reef biology and conservation, and, and also uh, uh, protected species in Asia Pacific countries, a lot of countries. We are almost a, a 4,000 staff uh, organization with more than uh, 600 scientists, all these different chapters, regional programs, um, country programs, they have different scientists as they need them. In Texas, we have around 90 people working, uh, having a million members. Uh, across, the, uh, across the globe. People can subscribe to Nature Conservancy, get our magazine, get all kinds of information. Similar to you will subscribe to Audubon Society or National Geographic, you can subscribe to the Nature Conservancy. And that, the revenue from, from the membership, uh, which I think it's around $30 or so, um, uh, constitutes a third of our revenue. So we get, uh, we're not a foundation, so we don't have an endowment to do everything we do. We do have small endowments to do things that people want us to do, and we believe that that's the right thing to do. But for the most part, a third of the revenue comes from the membership. Uh, the second third of the revenue comes from um, seeking funds through grants. So we submit grants to foundations, to uh, state and, and, and federal agencies, and uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, of private entities as well. And then the, um, the, the, the last third of our revenue comes from donations secured by our philanthropy team. So we approach people by asking them to donate money to the Nature Conservancy. Typically these, are, uh, they, they, these range from a few thousand dollars to, I don't know, $20,000 maybe once every two years. Some people donate us money maybe, I don't know, uh, a million dollars every five years, and there's a, a few people who actually donate money to like $10 million to Nature Conservancy once in their lifetime. So we put that money into the things that we believe that they are going to be very good investments, so that money really serves um, the purpose. Um, so we work, I told you that we work on these regional chapter, or I mean state chapters, and then we have these regional programs, uh, the Gulf of Mexico being one of those. And the reason we have a Gulf of Mexico program is because the Gulf of Mexico is one of our whole systems. Nature Conservancy moved to work on places, I mean, that has always worked on places where we moved to work on whole systems, these systems that we believe that they are, uh, there are threats for them, and uh, they are very important to serving not only the last great places in the globe, but also um, they provide benefits to humans and they are relevant for also society. So the Gulf of Mexico, the entire Gulf of Mexico large mine ecosystem, that's another way to call it, we consider it our uh, whole system of the Gulf of Mexico. So we have a Cuba program, we have a, a, a different state chapters along the United States from Texas all the way to Florida, and then we have a Mexico program uh, that they all together work in this Gulf of Mexico program. Uh, my, my career uh, started as a, as a scientist, uh, as, as, as you are doing, so my bachelor's, I'm, I'm actually an engineer by training, so I am a marine biochemist. Never really worked as a marine biochemist, my track was always um, coastal ecology, and then very early in my career, I decided that I wanted to work in conservation, working for different organizations. So um, I decided after that that I wanted to get some, some technical tools that will help me, and I'm glad that I made that decision to, to learn GIS and remote sensing, which these special tools have become my main toolkit, part of my main toolkit to work in conservation. And then after that, I started working on different organizations until I pursued my, my, my PhD in Spain, as you just, just, just mentioned, when we went to the same school. And when I came back to the United States, I was hired by uh, the Heart Research Institute at Texas A&M University, where Brittany is coming from as well. I'm very happy to see familiar faces here. Um, I, I conducted my postdoc uh, doing different projects, ranging from um, uh, ecological economics and environmental economics all the way to biodiversity mapping, and I'm going to show you an example of that. But I, I knew that I wanted to stay close to the Gulf of Mexico. I'm from Veracruz along the Gulf Coast, so Veracruz is right here um, in the southern Gulf of Mexico. So. Uh, I've been diving since I, I can remember as well, and, and uh, I'm fishing. And I wanted to be close to a place where I could make a difference. So I, I came back to the States hoping that I could stay, and, and I'm glad that uh, and, uh, I, I can stay and develop science with the Nature Conservancy so I can 
continue helping not only the northern the Gulf of Mexico, but also the southern Gulf of Mexico, and working in Cuba a little bit as well, every time more. So my marine science program uh, of the Nature Conservancy was a new program. We had a coastal program in Texas. We didn't have anything going on beyond the, uh, the what we call the in-bay water, so the, our, uh, all of our bays along Texas. And when I came, I was tasked by my supervisors to develop a marine program and get involved in other aspects of, of marine conservation and Gulf of Mexico conservation that were important. So these are examples of the different projects that I'm working on. So uh, one of my early projects, uh, and we continue doing that now, it's understanding climate change information and impacts and taking it down to what is relevant for us in the coast. So we use the, what is called this land model, which is a model that is very efficient in telling you where your, your new habitats are going to be, in, where, where your habitats are going to be in the future along your, your coastline, mostly marshes in the tropics, uh, mangroves. Um, so uh, we, we use that model to answer a question, not exactly where your shoreline is going to be. We're not very interested in that engineering question. We're more interested in knowing where the habitats are going to be able to migrate and keep providing those benefits and values or not. So this land model will tell you where your marshes will be potentially, assuming some, I mean, making a lot of assumptions, as, as many models do. And we have developed these models uh, in different bays along the Gulf of Mexico, covering all Florida, a uh, good part of Texas bays, and a good number of the kind of northern Gulf of Mexico bays, including Mobile Bay, Grand Bay Near. Those were projects that we conducted a, a few years ago. All that information is accessible through different web pages. People can visualize it and uh, play with it in what, what we call the Coastal Resilience Decision Support Tool. Or you can download them from a, another, a second web page where you can just go and download all the GIS data and use it for your own projects. You can go to slrportal.org and download all these models, for example, the mobile model, and then um, use it in your own projects in looking at the, where potentially marshes might be by the half the century or the end of the century. Uh, another type of projects that we're working very actively, I told you, Nature Conservancy will work on restoring habitat along the coast. Being oyster reefs and seagrasses, two good examples of that. So we, we, we try to uh, restore the capacity of these endangered or threatened habitats um, to keep providing benefits, not only to back to nature, but also to, to people in, in regulating uh, wave energy and moderating the, 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 the erosion along the coast and coming with a way for us to promote uh, the green infrastructure provided by these different habitat as a good thing for, I mean, for coastal communities to, you know, be, protect themselves as well. Other type of projects that we're working on are in ecosystem services. So my dissertation, uh, my dissertation actually I mentioned to you was on uh, uh, ecological economics. So we keep assessing the value uh, and the, especially the non-market value of these different conservation targets that we call, whether it's species, habitats, ecosystems and see what, what, how that relevant for society and, and, and contributes to people, people's well-being. So we, uh, we have a project right now, for example, in identifying which, ecos which indicators of those metrics used to monitor uh, species, habitats, they are relevant for us to assess in the future changes in the, the provisioning of the ecosystem services um, along the coast. So more recently, we've been working in a couple of projects. One of those is understanding connectivity uh, I told you that uh, working at the whole systems is relevant for us, but we needed to connect the dots on how connected and if it's connected the Gulf of Mexico. And so there's been a speculation that, you know, all these systems obviously are, are very connected, but we wanted to provide some examples for that. So we went ahead and used uh, coral larvae uh, and run a model for the entire water Caribbean, so in Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. And uh, we let uh, coral larvae to uh, go around with the currents all, all across this uh, couple of uh, basins, and uh, we, we, we identified which of those coral reefs were more connected to other coral reefs and were contributing larvae to these different aspects. So in trying to understand which reefs were the, the, the big contributors and which, were, which of those were more isolated, potentially having a recruitment issue. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. Uh, talking about the connectivity aspect, we also wanted to try to understand connectivity, uh, uh, things that people can't recognize to try to develop messages that we could use to conserve those species. So we, we choose vertebrates, so uh, fish, sea turtles, marine mammals, and birds. And we, uh, uh, we gather pieces of information that speaks for the movements, a lot of satellite data, some telemetry, other type of telemetry data, and we compile a set of uh, uh, maps and analysis to identify their pathways throughout the Gulf of Mexico. And that's the project that I'm going to show you more. And then the second project, um, that I said that it's kind of new for us. It's, we're working with NOAA and uh, other organizations in Mexico and Cuba 
in, in helping them consolidate what it's called the international network of marine protected areas along the Gulf of Mexico. So NOAA in the United States has signed two agreements uh, with uh, the different agreements, one with Mexico, one with Cuba, in recent times to develop this uh, international network of protected areas. So in 2012, in San Francisco, so away from the Gulf, NOAA decided to sign an agreement with Mexico in which they will develop a, a, a network of, of, of sister sanctuaries between the U.S. and Mexico. And then more recently, last November, in Cuba, we were at a conference in Havana, and um, um, Dr. Sullivan, the, 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 the director of NOAA, came to Havana to sign that famous agreement between NOAA and the, uh, the, the, the Ministry for the Environment of Cuba, in which they agreed that they were going to, to sister, to pair, uh, the, the Florida Garden Banks in Texas and the Florida Keys, National Marine Sanctuaries in the United States, to Cabo San Antonio, Cape San Antonio in, uh, in Havana, which is part of the Guanacabibes National Park, to have this uh, whole international network of marine protected areas going. So that's been very interesting, but now NOAA has two different agreements and two different uh, whole set of partners to work with. So we are, we're, uh, we're working with them and, and hopefully to help them in the future to consolidate this into an international network of marine protected areas in which also Mexico and Cuba participate you know, with, uh, with, with, with each other as well. So um, in talking about the Gulf of Mexico, uh, there is a, a story that I like a lot and uh, interests me a lot as well in, in understanding biodiversity, but also traveling around the Gulf, I came across this, this story about the discovery of the Gulf of Mexico. So it's, it's not very clear, I mean, who discovered, when it was discovered the Gulf of Mexico and how all these accounts of biodiversity and science got started. So um, this is, uh, this is Havana, this is the, the Bay of Havana, and that's the famous lighthouse on the Moro Fort, that's a Spanish fort. And this plaque right here to Sebastián de Ocampo, which is, was a Spanish sailor, it's right there at the base of the, of the lighthouse. Anybody can see it who visits this. And it says that in uh, 1508, Sebastián de Ocampo was the first person to actually circumnavigate Cuba and prove that it was not main continent and then prove that there was an ocean beneath and then nobody knew it was a gulf, but that was the beginning and the birth of the Gulf of Mexico and not uh, Columbus reaching mainland at that level. He reached mainland in, in his third and fourth uh, trip, but not in his first and second trips. So um, to, to greet in history, in a few books, Sebastián do Campo, it's really recognized as the discoverer of the Gulf of Mexico or, or that sea beneath uh, Havana uh, or, or Cuba, the, the island. And uh, Spain and, and Cuba celebrate that in uh, 1996 by developing this plague here. But the story and, and the interesting part is that in 1500s, Juan de la Cosa, who was one of the owners and, and sailors, captain of one of the three initial uh, ships that Columbus sailed to, uh, in his first trip to, to the new continent, um, he developed this map, uh, which is it's called the Juan de la Cosa map. It's at the... Um, Naval Museum in Madrid, in Spain, and it's, it's, it's believed to be the first map of the Gulf of Mexico. You can see that Havana is depicted uh, right here, and then there is a, a, a Dominican Republic here and, a, and Haiti, and then there you see other islands here. And it's not really a Gulf, but the, uh, the, the cartographer, Juan de la Cosa, he, he was a captain, a, a, a businessman, but also a cartographer. He chose this projection, as you can see that all the continent curves, and he's depicting things that they were not discovered at the time, like South America. So this is very strange. I mean, how somebody, you know, who never really sailed around the, uh, the island, because Columbus, he, uh, he banned any of his sailors to go around and prove that he never made it to the, in, to the, to the Eastern Indies. He, he, didn't, he wanted to return, saying that he actually reached his, um, his, uh, his mark and, and, and his target, and not really just reaching to a, a, an archipelago of islands. So these guys, um, nobody understands if uh, Juan de la Cosa is actually depicting a Gulf of Mexico or just depicting a coast. In any case, that uh, insert here, it's a saint, as many of the uh, Catholic culture uses saints. And uh, this is, uh, I think, San Juan Bautista, because they, they, they reach the, the, uh, the land on, on the day on San Juan Bautista, I think. So these guys decided to put it. And then there is the Basse Müller map uh, from 1507. This is a German cartographer who never made it to America, as many cartographers did at the time. 
They just record their uh, data coming from navigation logs. Uh, that people will give them that, and they, they will use all that and interpret it to, to build the maps. So these people never really made it to uh, any of these places. And this is the, uh, the, what it's believed to be the most important map for the United States because it's the first map in which America, it's, it's, it's uh, written and, and, and it's written right here around Argentina, uh, based on uh, Basil Mueller's belief of uh, America Vespucci being the, the, uh, the, um, the founder of the Americas. Uh, who he wasn't for a time, but uh, he also depicts kind of a, a, a something that might be the Gulf of Mexico. This is Q again, and this could be the Gulf of Mexico, but there is a pass. So that pass is believed to be something that the Spaniards wanted the Portuguese to believe that there was a pass, so they will try to reach the Gulf of Mexico from there and not from the south. And uh, people say that that's why the cartographer never show kind of the Patagonia here, so they don't want it to the Portuguese to, to, to know that there was a pass here. They wanted to confuse them by thinking that there was a pass here. So it is interesting to me. I mean, it was really until 1508 that there is great proof that the Gulf of Mexico was discovered. And all these different pieces of information kind of showing you know, that there might be a gulf behind, but not really a gulf all due to the projections and, and all this confusion to try to, to appropriate all this land at the time. So um, what, it's, what it's true, and uh, we know that, is that Cuba became the, the entry point to the Gulf of Mexico. And that's true to now. I mean, this is the coat of arms of, of Cuba, the country. And what it has right up front on the sea, it's a key, because Cuba believes to be the key of, to the Gulf of Mexico. So one side is the Yucatan Peninsula, the other one is the Florida Peninsula. And Cuba believes that they are the key to the Gulf of Mexico, to the discoveries, to understanding. And I believe that that's also the case for us now in protecting resources in Cuba before it's too late um, and making it a, you know, a true key to understanding the Gulf of Mexico. So the f some of the first accounts to biodiversity in the Gulf, they, they come from the, the actual trips of Columbus, the Admiral, uh, reaching Cuba. And in his second trip, they went to this area right here. So Guantanamo is right here, Havana is up here. This area here, you don't see all the details, but there's kind of a thousand islands. Of, uh, they are called uh, Gardens of the Queen. That's one of the, what is believed to be the most pristine, or the pristine, or the only pristine, uh, coral reef in the entire Americas. Uh, a, a very healthy reef, coral coverage, a lot of big predators as well. Uh, a lot of people, National Geographic, CNN, have in the past few years been diving here and showing the, some documentaries. What, when Columbus uh, hit that area, he, uh, they, he has in, in, his, in his memory says that they could literally step on top of sea turtles and never really touch the water and in order to get from the ships all the way to the, uh, to the beach. There were so many sea turtles that they could actually, that's what he thought, could step into, use them as stepping stones to reach the beach in that particular area. So um, that's pretty interesting because this picture right here, some of you might have seen them, it's the famous 1947 uh, Kemp's Ridley uh, Arribada, which is the beach uh, event, uh, as they, it's called in Mexico, 40,000 sea turtles in one single day of this Kemp's Ridley in uh, Tamaulipas Coast. So there's a famous um, beach in Tamaulipas called uh, Rancho Nuevo Beach, and uh, that's the, the main site where 99% of the population of, of Kemp's Ridley nest in the world, in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, this picture does not show the, all the $40,000, but they were surveyed at that time, and uh, we haven't seen anything like that since. I want to show you a picture that it seems something similar, but it's only a few hundred actually what is happening. So um, more recent accounts of this biodiversity in the Gulf, the way I like to see it is how animals aggregate while they're migrating. So all these pictures were taken, including this Camp Ridley in, in Rancho Nuevo Tamaulipas from 2011, were taken in the Gulf of Mexico, except for the sperm whale. I couldn't find one of several sperm whales in the Gulf of Mexico like that. But all other pictures of migratory vertebrates, they are aggregating for feeding or reproduction purposes or other climatic migrations that they might express along the Gulf of Mexico. And I like to think about biodiversity also in a way that they become these important uh, and express these important uh, functional events uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. And this is important for us to pay attention to, especially because they become very vulnerable where uh, the fisheries resources, for example, are targeted at the time that they are migrating. So 
this slide really shows a snapshot of what we know about the Gulf of Mexico. And you can also think it as the way of the biodiversity that the Gulf of Mexico contributes. So it's showing that larger, I mean, larger amounts of biodiversity, uh, in this particular case is, is diverse, diversity data or diversity index uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. So we don't believe that the Gulf of Mexico is more diverse than the Caribbean or, or adjacent seas, or, or uh, if you can think of that. It, it's just that there is more data in the Gulf of Mexico. And we are fortunate to work in a, in a sea that all that data hopefully can become available. It takes a while, and uh, that's pretty much uh, a lot of my days and nights trying to gather data for my work because what we do, um, it's, a, it's basically applied science in synthesizing existing databases. So I use all of these data uh, uh, very often. And you can see, I mean, uh, the differences between the Gulf of Mexico and the adjacent seas or even the Pacific areas, the, the Atlantic areas. And some of these uh, contributions to information becomes from also not only from scientists, which is hopefully the vast majority, but also the industry and other uh, citizen scientists also contributing data to make the Gulf of Mexico one of the best known uh, seas in terms of biodiversity. You can compare it to the fourth. I mean, this is uh, the fourth as Ovis calculates uh, four by um, days of, of data. You can see the amount of data in the east, uh, east coast of the United States, the Gulf of Mexico, as compared also to the rest of the Atlantic, the, the rest of the, uh, the Caribbean as well. If we wanted to de-aggregate this data by different vertebrate groups, this is what we know about bony fish. Also, this is the amount of data available for bony fish, sharks and rays, sea turtles, and cetaceans. And it's really amazing to me that we know more about cetaceans than we know about sea turtles, because I think we know more about sea turtles than cetaceans. And I want to tell you more when I talk about migratory species. But um, this is uh, a project that when I came to Heart Research Institute years ago to work, they were completing this first full inventory checklist of all the species known to science, uh, scientists. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So this is the famous Felder and Camp, 2009. This is the big book. I don't know if you've ever seen the actual book, but it's this thick. Um, and uh, uh, Wes Tunnel was finishing this break with uh, Derek Felder and, and David Camp at the time. And you can see the orders of magnitude of how the knowledge compiled from a few thousand, I mean, a couple thousand species from the uh, the, uh, the Gulf of uh, document in 54 to the 2006 compilation of knowledge of all known groups from bacteria to plants um, in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. This became, it has become a, a very good tool for me and, uh, and you know, in reconciling how all the information reconciled. And one of my postdoc projects was to actually translate that book into spatial data and to map it and understand the, the patterns of biodiversity across the Gulf of Mexico. So we developed this uh, GIS project in which we, we know which species occur in each of these eight areas along the Gulf of Mexico. And that has also became a very important tool for the work that we do. So again, the Gulf of Mexico, a very complete inventory, a lot of differences with the different regional seas of the United States doesn't necessarily represent, or we believe that uh, the Gulf is more diverse than these other uh, areas. It might be, but uh, it's just that none of these other regional areas have as much information being compiled, put together, which was the big uh, contribution really of the, of, the, uh, of the biodiversity book compilation as well. The Caribbean went through a similar process under the Census of Marine Life. I don't know if you guys remember the Census of Marine Life project, uh, finished it in 2010. A very uh, large effort to also compile biodiversity information. And uh, the Caribbean Sea was one of those projects, but I don't think they never really get to put all that information together in a single place. Um, I mentioned to you that it's important for us to know what species are, where they are, but also we're thinking of trying to understand which species are more relevant for us to try to, to look into become conservation targets. Those species that might, might play important roles, uh, not only in, in the ecological structure and function, but also in the, ap in the appreciation um, uh, of people and, and their, their, the services that they provide to people. So about a, a couple of months ago, we published this paper about um, identifying connectivity of coral larvae in the wider Caribbean. So we have a, a, a full GIS and, and information that it's more than this map, as you can imagine, showing all the interactions and connections 
and the strength of those connections between the different reef systems across the entire Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. So you can see, for example, that the Flower Garden Banks and the Veracruz Reefs are definitely more isolated than the rest of the lower Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean reefs. You can see the contribution of Cuba as well, Bahamas, Cuba, um, the Mesoamerican Reef, and a few other areas that they have the majority of the contribution, contributing larvae, coral larvae. I mean, these are uh, hard corals, uh, uh, reef formers uh, along the Gulf. And if you want to see it in the form of a table, we have this table in which you can see which countries contribute the most and uh, receive, uh, contribute the most and receive the most larvae from other places. So location is very important, as usually is, uh, for uh, having and developing a, a healthy coral reef given currents. So this model uses actual currents measured by NOAA and using models of uh, how, how uh, larvae is dispersed along um, the entire Caribbean ocean. And migratory species will be important for us in, in understanding connectivity as we can develop messages that people can understand for sea turtles, for marine mammals, for fish that they are commercially important, and for birds that people enjoy and appreciate uh, very often. So we're working on migratory connectivity, which is this concept of understanding the full cycle of animals, not just while they're in the United States or while they are in Texas, for example, or Alabama, but what's the relevant parts of these life histories that, and the threats that they, uh, they, that they come with as they are migrating from the Atlantic into the Caribbean or from the Gulf into the, into, uh, back to the Atlantic Ocean, for example. And that's important because all those interactions uh, with threats and, and, and on all the biological interactions of these species, they will, they will be significant for the viability of those populations. So migratory connectivity allows us to connect those dots of what habitats become important for the species uh, at what time of the life history. So we're on trying to uh, are researching on the timing of the migrations, what those pathways and blue ways are in, that they are using to migrate uh, throughout the Gulf of Mexico and adjacent seas. Uh, also, aggregations I mentioned to you become very important because they are very vulnerable, as you know. I mean, animals become very vulnerable when they are aggregating at th in those numbers. And then what is that migratory connectivity? What, what habitats are important in maintaining those populations, for example? So we, we frame that work on the question of, um, I mean, typically with the point data that I show you that there's, there's now, I mean, years ago, everybody remembers it was very hard to get any point data coming from handheld GPSs or big GPSs. Everybody really kept that data. Now it's available throughout the internet. I mean, every country, every major institute, uh, they, they contribute data to different national and international databases. But when it comes to the movements, it's very hard. I mean, you, you know, I mean, this technology, it's emerging and it, 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 it's coming really fast, but at, but at $3,000 or $5,000 per satellite tag, it's very complicated that we're gonna be actually really uh, putting them to a full population or anything close to that. So most of the actual products that we have for conservation, including essential fish habitat, for example, for all of the coastal migrants or the pelagic migrants, uh, uh, highly migratory species along the Gulf of Mexico, it's still being derived using point data and home ranges techniques such as this one, which is just capturing all the points that you know about a particular species that it's called the convex hole. We do that in GIS all the time. It's not very complicated, but at the same time, it's very simplistic because you have data coming from all kinds of times and all kinds of different um, ages and, and times of these, uh, these populations. So our question is if uh, essential fish habitat remains being the main tool that we can use to identify those important areas for conservation or it's something else. So we are choosing vertebrate species um, uh, of fish, mammals, sea turtles, and birds to really try to understand if there's a better way that we can map those different distributions at a different times. So habitat use at different times of the species and what are those pathways that potentially become important to protect and conserve. So um, fish, for example, there is 15, more than 1,500 species of fish uh, all these numbers come from the Felder and Camp uh, uh, literature. But of those fish, I mean, really all 79% of all the high migratory species uh, as, as managed by NOAA and, and, uh, and FAO, I mean, they are in the Gulf of Mexico. So the Gulf of Mexico really has a very good number of migratory fish uh, and, and many other groups of fish, uh, not only the highly migratory species 
that they are representative of migratory species in the Gulf. Uh, these are mostly ocean adromus, I mean the highly migratory species, but we also have a good amount of diadromus fish and a lot of other spe uh, species that migrate using different strategies. Of all 29 uh, marine mammals in the Gulf of Mexico, all 29 are reported to be migratory, but very little information actually exists for anything beyond sperm whale and manatee. I mean, when, you, when it comes to all the pelagic species of, of dolphins, very little is known about their migrations. If we, we look at all the Navy reports and NOAA rep stock assessments, and I mean, none of them really conclude on how and where do these species migrate. Um, so we have in our study manatee and uh, sperm whale, and I wanna show you examples of that. Uh, but not really, I mean, we want to increase our understanding of what other species of cetaceans also migrate and will be good case studies. Uh, all five sea turtles in the Gulf are, are migrants, all of them, and uh, the issue, the primary issue with sea turtles, as you, as you know, is that most of those populations, uh, we know of those populations are females that come to nest when they're attacked, so we know a lot of those, but we barely know anything about juveniles and, and, and males that they spend all their life, uh, the rest of their lives in the ocean, for example. Gladly, there's a couple of projects that I, uh, I became aware recently uh, in Florida that they are specifically tagging juveniles of sea turtles. So they are going to the ocean, capturing while they're in the ocean, tagging them so they can, you can track a juvenile, for example, as compared to tagging a female. All of our data in this story has been coming from nesting beaches and females. Um, for birds, it's very interesting because there's a lot of knowledge about the birds, but all that knowledge also leads to a lot of questions and, and more caveats. So um, the, the, the Felder and Camp document recognized 395 species of birds or, or migratory birds, but there are a lot of other animals that we just don't know if they are partial migrants and they come uh, and they are recognized right now as, part, uh, as, as uh, vagrants, uh, species coming to, to the Gulf of Mexico, or they, are actual, or they are actually migrants coming to the Gulf of Mexico. So we're working on on, on this analysis and I'm trying to compile a, a checklist of who migrates in the Gulf, coming out with a definition of what the Gulf is also. And then, because if you think of the birds, it's more complicated. So aquatic species is easy, but if you include the birds, it's more complicated. So we're coming with definitions of what different migration, uh, migrations are for all these four groups, and then checklist for, uh, for all of them. Um, sea turtles and marine mammals, as I said, it's not that hard, birds, knowledge exists, but when it comes to fish, it's definitely much more complicated. If you think of, uh, there, there's gobies, for example, that they are mi they migrate. Gobies, is, it's a group of fish that actually develop in fresh water, and then they came to, to marine waters. So a lot of those fish are diadromous and other strides, and we're trying to, you know, uh, mine all that information to come up with uh, that. These are the species that we included in what we call phase one of the study. Uh, good representatives of all these groups. Uh, these are endangered species, threatened species, commercial species, very well-known species, charismatics. Uh, all are a, a combination of all of those. So we have several fish, including a couple of sharks, uh, two marine mammals, I said, uh, also uh, in addition to manatee, sperm whale. Uh, we have um, all four sea turtles, I mean, four sea turtles out of five we left out just because we, at some point, we needed to draw a line of the amount of data that we could seek and analyze. Uh, we left out hawksbills because hawksbills are more tropical species dependent on tropical coral reefs. Um, but we were including into phase two. And then we have seven birds uh, uh, from pelagic species like uh, Audubon sheet water over here. This is a, pelagic, a marine pelagic species of, uh, of uh, sheet water all the way to species like whooping crane and um, uh, the endangered whooping crane and redhead that come from, 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 from North America and they migrate to the Gulf coming to the Gulf Coast uh, to migrate. And we, we compile, we spent like eight months just compiling and mining for data, uh, movement data, which I told you it's very hard to actually get that data. It's not that we're gonna find a lot of movement data in, 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 in online databases in the internet, very little is available. I mean, the sea turtle community actually were the ones that get started a lot of these portals, but you cannot use data from any of those. You really need to get it by approaching individual researchers and research centers. So we work with more than 100 collaborators, sci scientific collaborators. Not all of them are depicted in this slide, but we have a, in one of our reports an appendix with more than 100 people named and institutions uh, that they provide us with movement data uh, for the study. And this is the famous spaghetti model for us in which we have all those four different groups. Uh, over here it says 650 um, um, satellite tracks, but we have more than 900 satellite tracks now 
for all these different four groups. You can see some significant differences. For example, all the purple over here, are very coastal data, mostly coastal data are the sea turtles, because as I said, these animals come out after reproducing and, and hatching, I mean, and, and laying their eggs in the, in the beaches, and they go to these foraging areas to replenish energy after reproduction. So most of those, that behavior is expressed in that coastal information here. You can see how all that data and how very typical these sea turtles go out throughout the Gulf Current into the east coast of North America and even Europe. And we have data that connects the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the British Islands uh, for sea turtles. Uh, you can see also red uh, sharks. Uh, this is almost only all this um, uh, deep ocean data, including the aggregation data, is uh, well shark. That's a species that we choose because it's very charismatic and can help us uh, convey these messages. And also, good databases exist. So we think we compiled for for um, for well shark the most the most um, complete data set from coming from two out of the three main researchers working on on. Uh, understanding whale shark in the Gulf of Mexico, in Mexico and the United States. Um, we also did similar for birds. So what you see here, this is the sea turtle data that I mentioned to you going all the way to, to Europe. So all, all of this is uh, osprey, which is also a species that it's hard to understand because not all their populations migrate. So you have populations in the Yucatan and also the Florida Peninsula that they stay there all year round, or some uh, very few animals actually migrate of those populations. And then you have populations all over North America that they migrate to South America. So all of these start becoming very complicated for us, but uh, it's a good challenge because we wanted, as I said, to try to see if we could take a step from the actual observational data to the movement data. Uh, over here, we have broadwing hawk. Broadwing hawk, it's a medium-sized raptor. It's a hawk that migrates all the way from Canada to the Patagonia every year. Uh, places like the uh, Raptor Observation uh, Observatory in Corpus Christi, Veracruz, Panama, they see two million raptors every season migrating through a single point, uh, count by observers. Uh, so you can imagine, I mean, the, the, the amount and the huge uh, transit of these animals along in Gulf of Mexico. We compile information of the, uh, the migrations timing throughout the months, the peaks, the start of the migration. So these are synthesis tables. We have more detailed information coming from the databases of these different groups, at what time they migrate, what is the peak of the migration, what, where do they go before and after um, of their migrations. And for what, we, what we've done, what we could in mapping aggregations of these animals throughout the Gulf of Mexico, none of these databases really exist before. Now uh, I'm part of a project with scientists who are um, working on compiling for the first time a database of all uh, spawning aggregations of fish in the Gulf of Mexico. That's a restore project um, being uh, uh, led in Texas uh, by a couple of research institutions. But we did all this uh, compilation before that, and uh, we, we can see here, I mean, different the sizes and the, 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 uh, the amount of information and the differences between the information about sea turtles, uh, for example, sea turtle foraging grounds, there's more detailed information about those, and there is, for example, for those areas where tarpon spawns. So scientists in, in Florida working in, uh, in tarpon, I mean, they uh, hypothesize that these areas are where the deep, the deep ocean areas where tarpon goes once a year to spawn. I mean, they spend most of their lives in waters less than, you know, 30 meters deep, mostly 10 meters deep is where they spend most of their lives. They come to invade waters as well to feed, but uh, they go to 100 meters uh, 150 meter deep waters once a year to spawn uh, around these areas. So you can see the differences of the data, but some data exists also for fish and uh, definitely for, um, for sea turtles. And these are a couple of examples of our products. This is uh, bluefin tuna. Bluefin tuna is the most expensive uh, and valued fisheries in, in North America. Uh, you can, uh, they, they had um, this show showing, I mean, you know, the value and the amount of permits that they give in, in the um, eastern uh, area of Massachusetts to the banks where, where they can fish for a few animals every year. None of fisheries is supposed to happen in the Gulf of Mexico unless, I mean, commercial fisheries unless, uh, and recreational fisheries limited to trophy animals. And uh, they come to spawn in about this area right here once a year in the early spring um, in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the area where, where um, where they are supposed to be statistically more often to, 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 you are able to find larvae more often of bluefin tuna. This is the, 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 
in pink, what we have is the essential fish habitat developed by NOAA for the species, but these are really definitely the most important area for, for bluefin tuna. You can see the amount of data for each of these maps that we went in into this type of, in the legend here, and this is the uh, movement density products and corridor products that we developed using uh, a number of satellite tracks. We know that more data exists for bluefin tuna. It's not very easy to find. Um, but we are seeking more, uh, increasing uh, the, uh, you know, the precision of our products by uh, integrating more data. All these models can be run if we, I mean, very easy if we actually include more data. So this product, uh, it's, um, we put together all satellite tracks and we use this kernel density algorithms in GIS to come up with this uh, line density movement uh, um, product in which the darker the purple, what you see that there's more traffic of species. Obviously for these species coming from from the North Atlantic into the Gulf of Mexico, this area is of heavy traffic for them, and then they dilute a, they a little bit into the northern Gulf of Mexico, but not that much as you can see as well, and then using this part here uh, where they spawn, but also where they forage uh, as they come into the Gulf of Mexico. The, for each of these groups, we also developed what we call a threats analysis. So we didn't do it at species level, we did it by the group. Uh, so this is our threats analysis for the fish. And there is a number of, uh, so the darker, uh, the brighter the, the red, it's very high threats as compared to lower uh, green, which is very low threat. Uh, a number of layers went into this analysis and data came uh, to assign these weights came from literature. So for example, we, uh, we identified that bycatch, uh, mangrove loss, wetland loss, dams, lionfish predation, hypoxia became the most uh, relevant uh, threats for, for this particular group of fish that we choose, and that's how we compile this particular area here. So um, these areas are where most of the corridors overlap to higher threats uh, as compared to, um, to other areas. We did, all, this is an example also for green sea turtle. Green sea turtle is a species that primarily nests outside the Gulf of Mexico, whether e either in Caribbean or the Atlantic, um, uh, but they come as juveniles and forage in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have a little bit of data for them. Uh, and we do have some uh, satellite tracking data for uh, green sea turtles coming from the uh, tagging locations in the Cayman Islands, South Florida, around the Yucatan Peninsula. So you can see the branches of the corridor. And we, we always name these and call them partial corridors. So we don't have enough data to actually you know, say this is, these are the only areas that these species use. This is, the, this is the marine environment, species can go anywhere they want, assuming that, I mean, they, 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 I mean there's many ecological conditions that will prevent from that, but uh, where we try to brand these corridors are our partial corridors, where species primarily, given the data that we have, in this case, 33 satellite tags, they use to forage and they use to, to, to move around the Gulf of Mexico, in and out the Gulf of Mexico. One uh, that was lower head, um, lower head, and this is one of the threats uh, that became more important to lower head. 99% of the Gulf of Mexico and North Atlantic population nest in Florida, along the uh, Florida coast, and one of the main threats for them is light pollution. So these animals want to come to nest uh, at night. Kemp Ridley is the only species that nest during the day. All, over, all the other of these species nest during the, the night. They come at night and they find, let's say, around Tampa area, all this very bright light, or Miami area, all this bright light. They, they they think it's daylight, or who knows what they think, and they come back to the ocean and they don't, they don't produce eggs in that particular event time. So we have analyzed all that data and compiling areas, a, a strip along the coast, uh, where uh, there are, are more threats of uh, not being able to nest. And this is a sperm whale. There, are, there is good data for a sperm whale because of the connections between uh, the cetacean uh, ecolocation and the air guns used by the uh, explore, seismic exploration industry. And so BOEM and pre uh, previous to that, MMS has put a lot of effort or some decent, very good decent effort into understanding uh, sprint well. So um, this is the amount of data that we had at the time. Now we have much more data for all these species because we also uh, partnered with a Mexican institution who helped us uh, mine for more data in Mexico and we would like to do that the same thing in Cuba pretty soon. So at the time we developed all these products, uh, you can see, I mean, almost data limiting to the US EEC in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And then a number of sa satellite tracks, I think we have close to 50 satellite tracks coming from one of the BOEM and Texas A&M uh, University um, uh, studies showing us how this is a se semi-permanent resident uh, of sperm wells in the northern Gulf of Mexico, uh, 
shifting from the Louisiana uh, shelf to the Texas shelf of around 500 individuals and becoming very stable around that number of 500 sperm wells. We do have tracking data of, of sperm wells coming in and out uh, through the Florida Strait and the Yucatan Channel as well. But statistically, the, the, our kernel pollution for this species really limit the, the corridor to this area right here. And so one of the main threats for um, these large mammals and whale shark also for the case, it's still uh, being a collision with large vessels. So these animals, and it's recognized that for these animals, one of the main and biggest threat is still collision uh, by large vessels. So what you can see here is the density of line shipping um, uh, areas. Um, and so uh, uh, sprint, both the sprint whale and uh, whale shark, they have all these areas coming out. Houston, different ports uh, crossing the entire Gulf of Mexico while they are moving up and down here. And this is wood thrush. Wood thrush, it's a highly migratory bird. It's a songbird uh, that migrates again from Canada all the way to North uh, South America. Pretty long distance uh, uh, migrations crossing the Gulf of Mexico. And for these birds, actually, we had enough data that we could compile different pathways or, or flyways for the spring and the fall migration. And we want to start doing that as we can, and, and we, we find more data for the marine species as well. Because obviously, I mean, these corridors, we just don't, right now, we just have an indication of what the direction is of the corridor, but we just don't know if they change with the time and also with the conditions uh, of the migration. So uh, those species coming similar to the birds from north to south and back to north, I mean, we, we barely know anything of those for uh, the, uh, for the uh, aquatic species. For, but the birds, there is a little bit more data and that we were able to compile uh, these different corridors using, I think, 25 and 32 satellite tracks out of uh, this very large database for, uh, for these species. And if we put together all the aquatic corridors, so this is not including the birds, um, and overlap them, so we have 10 species of aquatic uh, species for which we could develop a corridor. So we could not develop corridors for reef species or very tiny birds, but we did for you know the sharks, the big fish, uh, the sea turtles, this, um, in this case, and we overlap that with all management and protected areas along the Gulf of Mexico in the three countries. We found that less than 1% of any of these corridors is protected, less than 1%, much less than 1%. For the birds, it's less than 20% uh, of all of the stopovers uh, being protected. So this is the information that we will be using to take it to the next level into a second phase in which we're turning some of our models into a network model to try to understand which of these connections or areas that they use become more important. So which habitats become more important to protect for the species. So for phase one, uh, we are reviewing uh, the, uh, we're proofing the final uh, version of two reports. There is gonna be a synthesis report, which is gonna be an executive report uh, for, for decision makers. And we have a full technical report of all this analysis that is hopefully gonna come up in, in the next month, month and a half. We are also, um, working on a digital atlas so people will be able to explore and overlap and turn on and off all these layers for the, uh, for the pathways of the species. Uh, and in phase two, we're doing several things as we uh, as we're able to secure more funding for the project. So the first thing is that we wanna understand these linkages of the migratory connectivity. So which habitats at what time are relevant. So we're turning our models, as I said, into network models to try to understand which nodes of those networks created by the species movements are important, including what opportunities will be for habitat restoration. Um, we are working, I told you, uh, with uh, uh, partners in Mexico to build databases and mine for data. It was very, not very efficient for me to try to do all that from, from my office in, in Houston. So uh, we, we contracted uh, Pronatura, which is the largest Mexican NGO, to help us spend seven months mining data for all these species and what they can find, what data. So we have a ton of new movement data for sea turtles uh, because the Yucatan Peninsula is very important for sea turtles and a good decent amount of data for, for birds and, um, uh, and fish and almost none for, for the big cetaceans uh, uh, in, the, in the southern Gulf of Mexico. We want to do that also with Cuba in the future and try to put together and increase our capacity to develop these big picture products. Um, we are gonna put all this information into a large conservation analysis this year uh, using MarkSan uh, optimization tool. MarkSan is a special analysis that talks to GIS in which you can, given a certain number of uh, conservation goals, so uh, an area for these corridors that we wanna protect and a given set of threats, 
that will threaten those targets, those conservation targets, which areas are where you can invest more. They're going to protect most of that area or conserve most of that area given those threats. So we're going to be developing that this year as well. And something that we want to do to the future is develop a tool where managers in the three countries, they can go and identify which frameworks for management and which tools for management have been used to manage migratory species in different countries. So, for example, the U.S. obviously has done a very good job over the many, many years in developing stock assessment techniques and tools, very quantitative tools and analytical tools, which Mexico and Cuba might not necessarily be able to implement or develop those big assessments. But maybe some of those countries, they've been more successful in identifying how to protect and how to manage migratory populations of birds. So a lot of ecotourism happening in South Mexico, maybe also in Cuba as well. We know that some of that is happening. So we want to provide all those different, the menu of opportunities to manage and frameworks to manage migratory species for these three different countries. So that's basically what I wanted to share with you. This is an example of how we are turning those kernel density models for lower head and Kemp Ridley, for example, into network models. So this is exact, I mean, these two models are based exactly on the same information, a set of satellite tracks coming in the form of polylines into GIS. And we have the time, we have the location of all those points creating these different tracks. And what this represents here is which nodes of that network becomes more relevant and which are the most important nodes to maintain the connectivity among the network. So if we remove these large nodes here, for example, or here, the connectivity with this whole area might be lost. So that's one way to look at it. So we're using this metric in network theory called between the centrality of which nodes become more relevant. But not only that, I mean, you can see how these two different views of the same data provide us with complementary information. So over here we have a series of areas along the coast, a very coastal area portion of the northern Gulf, in which these species, they spend more time maybe foraging while traveling, and also they spend more time traveling here. And over here we identify other areas where they might become more relevant because they still transit to them, they still use those habitats, and they need to go through those areas. And if we remove them because there might be another spill or there might be another threat happening, the whole connectivity for the network might be lost. I mean, it's not the case, but we just want to understand, I mean, how through network theory we can look at which areas, which habitats become more important of these species. We're also building this database of who is tagging which animals using satellite technology. There is other initiatives looking more into who is using acoustic telemetry technology. But I'm trying to reconcile information as I come across of who is tagging which sea turtles and who is tagging shark, who is tagging fish using different satellite technologies. So we can identify what the gaps are and which researchers might be in the future good partners to develop proposals. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you.